Hey guys, recently I asked what type of videos I should cover next and thanks to Burger Dude for suggesting I do a portal video. So here it is, a portal video about bloody time. Portal Stories Mel is a phenomenal game right off the bat and it's truly hard to believe this 8 to 12 hours experience depending on the size of your brain is actually another free mod that is if you own Portal 2 which you should. Mel is a character that was originally going to be the main protagonist of Portal 2 but due to the backlash of the removal of Chell she was later going to be alongside Chell in the co-op campaign before being scrapped altogether entirely. I believe Portal 3 isn't a game we need as much as Half-Life 3. There was no real cliffhanger. The game kind of concluded, but the longing for another Portal game still wouldn't go away as Portal 1 and 2 were masterpieces in itself. Portal 1 so much so that we didn't even need Portal 2, but as we know, Valve can't count to 3, so as always, the community has done a spectacular job filling in the void of longing for another another Portal or Valve title. In saying that, this isn't Portal 3. This game takes place in between the events of Portal 1 and 2, and the entire story, and more specifically the ending, makes me want this to be canon so damn bad. Portal Stories Mel not only has the same aspects that made Portal so great, environmental puzzles, entertaining characters, and a strong sense of doom awaiting around every corner, coupled with an ominous antagonist, but it builds upon it in many ways. The voice actors were phenomenal in their own right. Stig Sid Tangen voiced Virgil, inventing a new character entirely that fits so well within the story and the overall mood of Portal. He was a light-hearted and funny AI, and while he was definitely similar to Wheatley from Portal 2, he felt uniquely his own. Harry Callahan, not Clint Eastwood's Dirty Harry by the way, Way. On the other hand, voiced the antagonist Aegis and also did a Killer Cave Johnson impression. I honestly had to double check to see if JK Simmons didn't get hired for this project. But Harry helped out in more ways than one. He was the lead composer in cinematics and audio design that had a very, very polished and professional finish to the mod and made it feel like its own prequel. And it's not hard to see why. He created over 40 soundtracks to accompany this game that are just oh god damn dude the amount of passion this guy would have gone into to create this is unreal they all had a very retro slash portal feel to it and add a lot of personality to this mod track 7 testing begins and track 8 adjacency are probably my favorites but if you weren't aware harry callahan has been involved in many side projects that you may already be familiar with he has a whopping 200 million views on his his channel with a lot of his views coming from a lot of spectacularly made portal parody music videos such as Dumb Ways to Die Portal Edition and This Is Aperture. And he remastered the Join Us for a Bite music video and while I can't stand Five Nights at Freddy's, what he was able to do blew me away. This might have all sounded off topic but just thought this was something I should shine light on as he's extremely talented and deserves all the credit where credit's due. The environmental puzzles share the similar concepts derived from Portal 2, the bouncy goo, speedy goo, and an entirely new 70s themed portal gun. There are also sections where you're required to move boxes similarly to Half-Life 2 to get to the next area, which I thought was a great touch. The puzzles were all so similar to Portal and so inventive and challenging that if you're craving another Portal experience, this is a must get, but I will warn you, they're fucking hard. After chapter 3, I was having a brain fart in each area of my brain. Each new chapter, I'd be like, yeah, I know where to go, oh yeah, this looks like a piece of cake, then only to find out that some of these puzzles were so impossible to do. Then I figure it out later and call myself an idiot as usual. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why 
not, you stupid bastard. There's also an advanced mode, which is, to my knowledge, one of the only portal mods that has implemented this within the story mode to serve as a sort of hard mode, if you will. So there's room to replay the journey again and bash your head against the keyboard again. But although they're really challenging, it must have been even more challenging to invent them in the first place and make it enjoyable. This entire project blew me away entirely, in more ways than one. So without further ado, this will be my first and last spoiler warning. If you want to try this game out yourself, it's fun, free, and fantastic, and adds a lot of fan-made backstory into Portal 2 that will leave your mind blown. I highly recommend giving this a go before watching this summary and analysis of the story and events that play out, but with that out of the way, let's begin the recap of the events that occurred during Portal Stories Mel. The introduction alone is what kept me heavily invested from the get-go. The Aperture Science test subject Mel, who you will play as for the entirety of this mod, is a middle-aged Olympian woman in the 1936 Nuremberg Olympics, who doesn't have much of a backstory aside from that, but funnily enough, it's a lot more of a backstory than Chell had. You get a callback to Half-Life 1 and 2, starting on a carriage with with a one-way trip to inevitable doom. On this ride, you're greeted with a very convincing impression of Cave Johnson. Harry Callahan, yet again, good bloody job. The scripting of Cave Johnson was also on point. All right, you're now arriving at Aperture Central Station. <clears throat> Wait, Chris, get out of here. How do you spell station? Okay, think about that for a second. Okay. Does the station have an extra O before the I? Alright, listen to me. Back your things. Because you're fired! Get out of my office. Out. Get out. Out of my office. <clears throat> but, oh, I can't re record this. <clears throat> When you leave the train and make your way out, you're greeted with one of the coolest sights in any mod to date. The entrance to the Aperture Science building. But why do I believe this is such a powerful moment in this game? Well, because you never saw Chell enter this building. In fact, in the main games, you never see the front of this building at all from the outside. But this also had such an eerie feel to it as well. You don't see anyone working at all when you leave the carriage. And what's even creepier is when you first make it through the buildings, you come across a portrait of Caroline. I feel like it would have been so insanely awesome if you saw her in the flesh and she checked you in, but I completely understand that the developers of this mod probably didn't want to touch that character. The portrait alone was completely canonically cool. Alliteration. You make it to an elevator and come across a poop pantsing realization. Unlike Portal 2, where you start the game from the surface and head deep into the salt mines as the story progresses, you actually start from the salt mines and make your way up. Cave Johnson informs you that you will be testing the short term relaxation vault where you get your first cutscene. Hey, there's. There's actually cutscenes in this game. That's pretty cool, I'm not gonna lie. Mr. Johnson says you will be asleep for at most an hour, he says. But uh, after entering the vault, things go terribly wrong, and you awaken to a completely different voice pretending to be Cave Johnson. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, astronaut, Olympian, or war hero. There was a uh, slight problem with the test. Surrounded by a completely different Aperture Science lab from when you first entered. It becomes clear that you were not in here for mere hours. You were probably in here for nine, 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 nine. The introduction previous and the music in this scene makes it a lot heavier than Portal 2. Because you are well aware that Mel volunteered for this test and was a prime candidate due to her athletic abilities. Chell, on the other hand, was most likely a child of an Aperture Scientist due to the jokes GLaDOS made about bring your daughter to work day and implying that she knows her parents are already dead. I mean, we don't even know if Chell had 
much of a life outside Aperture, but she got a form of closure from GLaDOS, albeit in a messed up way, and it would be hard for Chell to process that, no doubt. However, imagine waking up and realizing that you slept through the death of everyone you ever loved or ever cared about within the space of a few minutes from Mel's point of view. To wake up and pull yourself together so goddamn quick is tough, but I know Portal characters don't really show emotion in the first place, so I'll swiftly move from that topic. What I like about the introduction to the game mechanics is there is none, apart from a short explanation of the new red wall mechanic, red wall bad. The game already assumes that you're well aware of the portal mechanics from Portal 1 and 2, and throws you in the deep end right off the bat with not only the portal gun, but the repulsion and propulsion gel. And while the conversion gel is not present in this game, most likely due to how easy some areas in Portal 2 became, and this game wants things to be as challenging as it possibly can, it's replaced with water or water gel that acts to extinguish fire. I very much appreciated how the game didn't hold your hand through these first segments, or any segments at all really. Cave Johnson, we can call him that for now, says it's definitely still 1952 and simply explains that Aperture went through some revamps. And that's why it looks, uh, kind of fucked up. However, after your first few tests, Virgil drops the curtains and reveals he isn't actually Cave Johnson, and you're well and truly stuck inside the Aperture facility in the future, and so is he. And he wants you to go swoop him off his metallic plates to help each other escape. The further along you go, the more dire your situation becomes. At first, the whole place becomes extremely unstable and starts to collapse in on itself. After trekking through the destroyed junkyard, it's here you finally meet Virgil, a maintenance corps that is delighted you made it to him or it. It's here he reveals how he's able to see everything and communicate with you utilizing the power of Wi-Fi, a concept that would probably fly over the head of anyone who is from the 1950s, but nevertheless you understand what elevator must mean, as Virgil says he's able to get you an emergency elevator to get the hell out of here. But before that, the mysterious voice shuts down the power and begins detecting life forms. For life forms. Unregistered life forms detected in the city. Commence intimidation program. Three targets acquired. One organic, two mechanical. And begins the termination program with a flooding protocol. And this becomes one of the greatest hunt downs of all time. With a hellbent AI trying to exterminate you, all the while being helped by Virgil, attempting to throw the tracking off guard by offering different solutions to puzzles to get higher and higher up the facility, such as rerouting elevators to send you to easier tracks. And it's quite funny how Virgil seems to be thrilled every time he tricks this mysterious AI, and overall makes things a lot more entertaining than Wheatley did, I think. Virgil then thinks if this thing is tracking organic things, maybe heading up to the overgrowth will confuse it, but things get suspicious as to why it decided to wake up decades later just to exterminate you. Virgil was able to run diagnostics on the machine and found out that it's known as the Aperture Employee Guardian and Intrusion System, Aegis for short, designed to protect the scientists. So it's here that Virgil suspects it's trying to protect the scientists, or maybe it's after you because it thinks that you killed the scientists. Further along, Aegis brings up a trap elevator, disguising it by saying, activating trap elevator. Activating trap elevator. Ah, it thinks you're going to use the elevator? No, 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 no. 
This is actually an achievement you can unlock on Steam. <laughs> I thought little things like this was quite funny. But following this event, it's here Aegis becomes more dangerous towards you by setting up turrets in your path to exterminate you with bullets instead of the flooding splooge protocol. When you inevitably reach the overgrown testing tracks, it becomes apparent that Virgil's plan was a huge success, and Aegis starts to have a difficult time in tracking you among the other organic matter. Alright, time to start hacking into these systems. Let's start guessing passwords. Um, password. Admin? Oh, come on. Let me in. Were these passwords generated by super geniuses? Did you just override the admin controls? Virgil informs you that you won't be seeing much of him right now and begins sorting through the computer files to get rid of Aegis. Then come to the realization that Aegis thinks you are the reason for the death of the scientists and he's not only after you, he's even after Virgil. And regardless of your sneaky sneaky endeavors, it begins adapting to your plans and swiftly resumes the extermination protocol. But it's here that Virgil comes up with a master plan. Virgil discovers that the turrets at the bottom of the facility have no security measures, so it could be possible to produce a friendly turret that will target Aegis instead of yourself. But before that, you can find a pretty funny easter egg in one of these testing tracks known as the Rainbow Core. Hello there, gorgeous. Might I say you're looking as beautiful as a rainbow. <laughs> Uh, 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 did you, uh, uh, by any chance, uh, get that core's serial number? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm asking for, uh, uh, a friend, yes, friend. And speaks in a similar way to the Adventure Sphere, or Core 2 from Portal 2. Virgil seems to fancy him as well, hoping Mel got his serial number. Come on, where where are the fanfics lads? The chemistry didn't even have time to flourish into a beautiful flower. And after this, you can come across a broken test chamber you'll need to find an alternate route through, as there's no way of solving it. But if you're a determined one, there is an achievement for solving it. Here, you'll also come across test cube manufacturing facilities that tests the bulletproofness of a cube. And you might question, but modifistic bulletproofness isn't a word. And while I can't find evidence that bulletproofness is a word, if waterproofness can be a word, then so can bulletproofness. I just added a word into the dictionary. How do you feel? I'm good with puzzles and Shakespeareanness. It's here Virgil finally declares if you wish to exit Aperture, you need to take Aegis out. So you venture down to reprogram those pesky turrets. Can you believe it takes six of those plates to make one cube? Ridiculous! But it seems that your efforts to help Virgil escape the scrapyard haven't gone unnoticed. While you're taking the elevator down to the final chapter of this game, he expresses his gratitude and conveys that he believes in you. I feel that the subtle character building moments between Virgil and Mel were done perfectly. Virgil proves to be a trusty and compassionate companion throughout this whole adventure, all the while being smart and actually helping you in genius ways, unlike Wheatley. But continuing on with the adventure, you make it through the security rooms to be ambushed by more turrets sent by Aegis yet again. And during one of these sections in particular, you use the repulsion gel to bounce all of the turrets away. This was so satisfying. Like I previously mentioned with my Snowdrop Escape video, Valve managed to make a game even more fun and enjoyable with the experimentation of physics 
physics in their games. It was so simple yet goofy, it reminded me of the classic Valve games that sparked a strong sense of childlike nostalgia in such a great way. But you finally make it to the turret programming area where similar to Portal 2 you have to alter the programming. However, instead of reprogramming the turrets to be defective, you reprogram the turrets to shoot something else entirely, the server banks. Did I mention this game is genius? Well, I'm, I'm doing it again. Inevitably, you finally face Aegis to shut him down. He starts dispensing the turrets, which little to his knowledge starts destroying the memory banks he has scattered around in easily accessible areas. But overall, I thought this boss fight was designed pretty well, especially the final stages of the timed events. However, I do need to admit, the boss fight and Aegis as a whole definitely lacks to GLaDOS in every way. I'm not saying it was a bad boss fight or Aegis is a bad character by no means. Harry did a perfect job with the voice acting for what it was and he could have been designed to have no personality at all. But it's hard to compare any antagonist to GLaDOS. GLaDOS had such a deadpan comedic character coupled with a very satisfying boss fight in both Portal 1 and 2 that just won't be topped by mods. But calling back to who exactly Aegis was tracking Remember how I mentioned there was three? Well, before shutting Aegis down, Virgil urges you to find out who else it was tracking, and you come to the biggest plot twist of this entire game. Aegis was tracking down and attempting to destroy GLaDOS. Virgil starts freaking out, theorizing that you two may have given GLaDOS a chance to regain power of the entire facility. But nevertheless, you want this over with, so you shut Aegis down and find Finally exit the facility. You reach the final elevator to end this entire adventure. You chuck your portal in the incinerator and Virgil extends his thanks for the last time and sends you on your way. Saying that the outside must be better than what's down here, but if you've played Half-Life 2 before, you know that's definitely not the case. You take the ride up a magnificently designed facility and come across the last and most powerful cutscene this game has to offer. The Outside. The outside for Mel is worse than she could have possibly prepared for, however there's another character who will go through all kinds of hell inside this facility in mere seconds. Shell is awake, and now Portal 2 starts. Portal Stories Mel isn't just a great puzzle adventure game, but a phenomenal story designed by people who truly care and love the Portal series. Filled with massive replayability and satisfying achievements to earn, you'll come back to this over and over again. Not to mention the abundant Easter eggs such as the goats you can find scattered around in hidden locations, alongside the Ratman High Hideouts. There's heaps to enjoy with this amazing game. This is probably the best Portal mod I have played, and I hope this team comes back to the Portal universe sometime in the future, even though their work here has been magnificent to experience as is. This shit was hard, but I honestly can't find any glaring complaints I have about this game, apart from one big one that pops up with a lot of these fan-made mods specifically. I didn't get to pay for it.